Thank you very much. Thank you for that in there. That would be a rich, almost breathless race through three very, very complicated cases, and I thank you for that. We still have, uh, we have about 25 minutes for uh, questions. Uh, Ibrahim, do you want me to moderate? Or yeah, you, sure. Yeah. Any, any questions? Bill Bruce. Yeah. Well, I want to congratulate you and thank you. This was impressive. It was, it was like a PhD dissertation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second Dr. Terence. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm glad Terence is here. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Doctor. Yeah. Um, it's, a very, it's a very small number of people, but there was a lot of talk about um, regional revolutionaries. Uh, yes. I don't know about in Yemen, but definitely in Tunisia and Libya. Did, is did you get to talk? A female revolution? Yeah. Thing? Okay. Yeah. Did you get to talk to yes. any? Okay, could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Okay. Do you want me to grab a, grab a few and yeah. then you'll take them? Who else has a question? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, also, I appreciate your uh, research and the sharing with you once, which was really impressive. Uh, but I have several questions. Yes. I will start from where. First of all, I didn't see any indication or indicators that why you select these three different countries, in which, uh, because they are completely different based on the past that they do have, about the population, education, you know, everything, economic development, and it's not just uh, because they are Arab, but, or the way actually uh, the movement is started, yes. and the way that they supported by the international community. Uh, because many of these issues that you brought actually related to that situation that they have. For example, in uh, Tunisia, when you are talking about the uh, NGOs uh, taking action in the national dialogue because of the many, many issues in the past, that they had some opportunity in education and also something that they did. Women movement there was very uh, impressive. And at the same time, uh, might be in Libya, there is because international force didn't give them opportunity. I didn't see this type of level of analyzing. So I would like to know more about uh, this type, how you select these different okay. the, the different countries, which criteria was that, and also the level of analyzing of all these things to that. Uh, a small question I do have about the ownership law that you explained in Libya. Why is, what so is it? Ownership, yeah. ownership law? Why is it so complicated? Because when they order the owners should leave and those who uh, stay in that home should they pay rent. Who receive this rent? So they should be, you know, in charge of solving this problem. So I, I think there is something else that I have missed. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure, sure. Do you want to take those? Yeah. I'll go for another round. Okay, good. Uh, the female uh, revolution or the uh, women revolution. <laughs> Actually, in Yemen, uh, if you go back, yes, the answer, the quick answer to your question, I spoke with uh, a number of women organizations and women activists, and I'll give you great, great examples of the success and the progress that women made in this uh, in national reconciliation in this country, including Libya. But before I get into Libya, uh, in Yemen, I call, uh, if you go back to the history uh, of the revolution, just a couple of months before the revolution began, the major story, if you remember, was there. It was about uh, an 11 years old uh, year, if you remember it, remember it? That went to the uh, court and divorced herself. Uh, and then Condoleezza Rice met her and gave her, remember? Yeah. That was just a couple of months before the revolution. Right? When the revolution began in Yemen, you know who started the revolution? Women, Yemeni women. So I call it actually, of my understanding of the revolution there, it's not only about, uh, it's not only about politics and dictatorship, but it's about social justice. Women in, um, in Yemen face huge level of marginalization, that they were not taking part in the revolution, uh, in the society. Uh, uh, so when, when the revolutions began in the region, it was women who led it in, in, in Yemen. 
So to me, it's not only about politics, but it's also about social justice uh, then in Yemen that women were facing in Yemen and they contributed like to the topic. And this is culturally, I understand it because I spoke with them. Uh, it became more of like shameful for men right, in Yemen that women are protesting in the streets and they were <laughs> sitting at home. So they had to go to the streets as well and contribute or participate in the revolution. And that's how you know, we ended up having a, a revolution in, in Yemen. In Libya, in Libya, one year, I, I mentioned the Abu Salim prison massacre that happened in 1996. And it was all hidden during those years until you know, people started to hear about it. Do you know when? In 2006 and 2007. Because the regime, there were families that when it started, you know, some rules to uh, go about, about this. What happened uh, is the son of Gaddafi, Saif al-Islam, engaged in some uh, deals with the, with the families' victims, with the families of the victims, like to buy their silence. You know, I give you this, I didn't do sign that you're good, you have nothing to do, you know, no legal actions or, or, or any so. The mothers of the victims, because, I mean, protesting in Libya was, uh, of course, you know, immediately would be crushed. Right. So the only party that, or the only people that were able to protest, right, and not by the security forces offices, just by the court were the mothers of the victims. That they went to the court every Saturday for one year, there in Tripoli, uh, in Benghazi, sorry, and protested by the court demanding to know what happened to their children. For one year, every Saturday that was uh, happening by the, the mothers uh, of, the, the, of, the, of the victims. Until later, you know, the revolutions began in Tunisia and others, and then that provided kind of like the foundation for the Libyan revolution for, uh, for that. And then two days after that, the mothers of the victims moved from the court to the Ministry of Interior, which is with a bold statement, we demand uh, the regime change, and then the Libyan revolution began. Now, now, and uh, uh, I met with uh, many, actually, women in organizations in Libya that contributing to uh, reconciliation. You have great examples. Uh, one like uh, Wafa al Naas, uh, her name is, is a women activist. That's uh, she's traveling to the south, to the mount, to the mountains, to to uh, do reconciliation between the tribes. Because in Libya, there is a failed state. There is no state, there is an absence of that. So who's playing this role? You know, as well as a civil society, uh, including or mostly taking a prominent role is women organizations. And not only this, actually, I found like uh, five or six women organizations formed officially just in the last uh, few months before I went there demanding like the, the UN, Secure, UN uh, resolution 1913, like for women empowerment in politics. Uh, they have established already and they've, they're working already and establishing and contributing to the transition and the resolution. And the work, uh, by the way, I have a major publication uh, uh, on Libya that's coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, and I talk about a lot, uh, also a special section about women uh, organization, you can see it, and they will explain uh, more about it. It's going to be out in a couple of weeks. Uh, so yes, that the women uh, role was uh, major. Why selecting these cases? Very simple, because each one of the cases took a different approach to dealing with the uh, transition and former uh, regime. What to do with the former regime? In uh, Libya, we have three different approaches completely. And that's what uh, uh, convinced me to, to select this case in particular, where in Libya, they defeated the entire regime and dismantled the entire regime. Uh, in, uh, in Tunis, Tunisia, uh, the former president left, uh, and then the, the state remained, uh, and then started to deal with within a legal framework. And in Yemen, a deal, basically. So ideal peace for justice, and of course we, uh, I'm sure you have a lot of discussion in conflict resolution on this dilemma of peace and justice and how to deal with it. So in Libya was, and Yemen was a huge uh, 
a manifestation of the peace and justice issue is that sacrificing justice for peace, right? To prevent Yemen from disintegration and uh, the sliding into civil war is basically, okay, we will uh, give you immunity for all past lives to the former regime, but leave, right? And that was the deal. Now, how effective is that? That's exactly what uh, encouraged me particularly is to, to study. Which one of the approaches, whether it's peace for justice deal or complete zero sum, win, win or loser, or a legal framework where both parties transition, which one can uh, work better for uh, reconciliation and transition, and how they can learn from each other. So that is the reason, and that's where the big cases that I found. Uh, ownership laws, why it is complicated? The reason why it's complicated, yes, if it stayed with the original uh, tenet, like in 1978, then probably would be easier. But what happened is that I am a tenant and uh, was living or renting an apartment in 1978, and then I get up in the morning and I find myself an owner, right, and the Gaddafi gives me uh, the ownership of this, uh, of this unit, then I keep it for a few months or a year or a couple of years, and then I sell it, and I take the money and go, right? And then now the new owners of the, of the unit, they paid money, their own money, they became real owners too, right? So now the argument is, and, and again, these units were sold like five, six times, and some of them 10 times were sold. So who is exactly the real owner of the, of the unit, of the apartment, of the property? It's no one knows. Uh, it needs the original owner were taken from them by force, of course, and they claim ownership of the apartment, and some of them re resorted to, to arms and violence to kick them out of whoever is living in the apartment. And others, they said, okay, we'll wait the legal, uh, when the legal system is established. So when you go uh, into Tripoli today, you will find uh, graffiti on so many places that I saw there, uh, like trying to document this property belongs to the owner of the name of such and such, who was the owner in 1978. <laughs> and this is a, called a sacred uh, ownership of of, the, of this unit or this property in uh, houses and lands also uh, they were taken so uh, Gaddafi created a lot of mess unfortunately and is just how to resolve it it becomes uh, a challenge for you all uh, about to resolve it. I have to take one, two, three questions. So, uh... Okay, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Uh, your, um, Presentation. I have uh, two questions and a request. Okay. <laughs> request if you can send us the slides of this. Okay. Uh, okay. Sure. I, me and I guess everyone in this room. Give me your I appreciate email. It. And we'll also have a tape of it on the uh, website under. Okay. I can send it to everyone who has signed in there. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. So we might be added to that. Thank you. Um, my questions. Yes. Okay. Culture. Yes. Okay. Do you think there is a specific cultural aspect which makes Libya very extreme in everything because it's the only one in everything is zero sum. Yeah. They, they don't have any middle um, uh, solution or they don't have, you know, they don't meet in the middle. And uh, personally, I, I know some of them. Yes. Uh, but why do you think Libya is the extremist? Yes. Uh, example. Good. Uh, the other thing uh, is that, do you think also uh, for the national dialogue, you said Tunisia, they started having this dialogue, okay, and, and all of us know that Tunisia is the fairest, the sparkle of the Arab Spring. Do you think others will follow as well? Follow to the Tunisian model? Uh, for having the national, because obviously, uh, like what you said, there is no like leadership for these people, you know, they're just people going in the street and they keep saying, you know, you a chef, you read the Scott and yes. they throw everyone out. And this is happening in Sudan for the last three days. Yes. So we just want to know. Great. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. So, <laughs> you had a question? Uh, yes, very interesting talk, but I was able to see a bit. Um, the most intriguing piece of it for me was the last statements about national dialogue as a source of theory construction. Fascinating to make this statement, uh, especially in the context of practice to theory, which has become a sort of the trend in the way to speak. 
Um, I wonder what sorts of theories uh, you find emerging in that setting, uh, and uh, and what and if this will be, if we'll see some kind of higher order synthesis emerging that will provide some sort of coherence to these movements. Thank you. Uh, thank you for very uh, informative talk. I really enjoyed it. And when you doing when you uh, when you were doing your research in Yemen, so the, how do people feel uh, about the usage usage of drones by the United <laughs> States? I know it's not very related, yes. but I'm kind of curious. Yes. Hearing from somebody who the topic came up, I imagine, from time to time. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We study yes. the conflict resolution. Yes. Too. Uh, whether drones uh, are effective conflict resolution <laughs> mechanism or <laughs> 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 Okay. Well, yeah, okay. Take, take All right. Uh, okay, let's uh, look. Now, uh, please uh, remind me if I miss any uh, point and try to uh, put them all together. Uh, uh, the first one is on the Libya, why it goes, why it is going to the extreme. Two reasons. Right. One is again back to theory. Is about, the, and I'm sure you have a lot enough about this uh, here of the balance of power. In Libya, there is no balance of power between the different spirits, between the different public parties. There is a zero sum. You know, there's a winner compared to another, there's a complete loser. So there is no, uh, there is no power balance in the first place. So uh, the winners are dictating. And they have the power to dictate, and the, los the losers of the, uh, of the war, they are only listening. They're not participating. So, this actually, what, what this power imbalance situation actually left uh, no incentive uh, for the winners of the, uh, of, the, of the war to compromise about anything. Why do we need to compromise? Why should we compromise? They should do what we tell them to do. So it became the, the relationship, the power relations between the new, the revolutionaries, you know, the ex-combatants, and the former regime became more of a one-directional relationship. You dictate, you, you order them to do, and that is that. So in the absence of a serious power on the other side, on the other side, then the rebels continue to go to the extreme. It's not about that the, uh, the Libyans are uh, culturally different from the rest of the region, but it's this power relations aspect that led to this. Why it is not the case in Yemen, because in Yemen was a deal. Right? The former party, so more of a balanced situation. So everything that is negotiated right, in Yemen. And same thing in Tunisia also. Though the former regime was defeated, but their supporters are still there. Um, that's one. The other reason is, so it's the, uh, uh, is power relations. The other reason is, Libya went also through uh, uh, repression under the former regime that left like incredible uh, uh, outrage uh, among the victims. That the only thing that they see is, and they say it. No, people, some of them not shy to say it, revenge and retaliation for all what they, what they went through. So Libyans, some Libyans, we have no one went or suffered what they suffered. And for that reason, they're going the extreme, is to uh, retaliate at the rich. Now, we want to explain to them that this is not the way to go. <laughs> you know, despite all that, what happened in the past, this is not the way to go. But this is, this is a major thing uh, in the, in the Lib Libyan revolution today, that uh, led or you know, uh, that led to this extreme taking the extreme on the uh, on the other side. Uh, I can give you one example. So just you see what is this? Is uh, like the former uh, when I was talking to one of the former prisoners who was in Gaddafi prison for 15 years. Uh, he was there in 15 years for. Uh, uh, the, the charges was the charge was that he uh, tried to destabilize the uh, Jamahiriya, the Gaddafi system, like destabilizing the country. For what? For just a, an affiliation with a political party. So, and he was sentenced for life, basically. And he was <laughs> telling me is that we went 50 prisoners to the court and uh, the, 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 the court. The judge was sentencing either 
exclusion, right, for just political party affiliation, uh, or life sentence. And he said, to the extent that we started joking, saying that the judge doesn't have change. So it's either life sentence or <laughs> no five years or 10 years or 20 years. So it's either death or life in prison, life sentence. He said, said you, know, you don't have change, you know, like five, 10 years. Or, and all for the same <laughs> charge, which is uh, just a affiliation with a political party. So that's how much they went through. That provoked an, uh, an extreme response. Now, how to contain this and how to, to channel it, that remains a serious challenge. And of course, I mean, this combined with the issue of the, the, the former regime was totally defeated, uh, left no incentive for them uh, to compromise. Um, the national dialogue, whether uh, other countries will follow, that was the question. Uh, follow Tunisia's model. Follow Tunisia model. I tried to contribute to encourage through my article in this one in foreign affairs, trying to see is that there is some model, there is a model that no one is paying attention to that is making progress despite the challenges. So to, to, to like to provide uh, like a, awareness like of the progress that the Tunisian model is making. Quite honestly, if you ask me, I'm not optimistic that they will follow uh, the Tunisian model uh, on the short run. Right. Now, remember also, as I outlined in the article, that the Tunisian model also faces some challenges. So it's not fully successful. If the Tunisian model becomes fully successful and able to manage the transition and, uh, and reconciliation in Tunisia, I think this will become a major inspiring force uh, for the people uh, of the region to look at that to follow. Now, no one is taking it very seriously. I mean, I recognize the progress because I come from a conflict resolution background and see how this is working. And I'm also looking at it from an objective, completely independent. You know, while you know others they they have stake in the issues and, and all that. So I think it needs time. It's not going to happen in the near future. It depends on how it will go in uh, the coming. Uh, months or years, if it manages to make uh, noticeable progress to the ordinary public, then uh, uh, we will not be surprised to see that Tunisia inspired for a revolution and Tunisia will inspire for uh, a successful transition. But this yet uh, to be seen. Um, the theory construction and uh, the, Tuni on the, the Tunisian model, right? Uh, whether uh, the question whether there will be a theory development uh, comes out of this. Uh, uh, this is uh, so far, I can tell you so far, the answer is no. There hasn't. Because everyone is uh, trying to make sense of, again, because of the absence of the theory, uh, theoretical framework, everyone is uh, trying to make sense of what is happening. Like in Egypt, they made the progress a little bit and then went back, you know, with a coup. And uh, so there is this debate, like one of the major things uh, that I noticed and in my uh, interviews, what do you really want? Uh, do you want uh, democracy? Do you want, uh, and they, you hear these terms. Some people say we want the democracy, others will say, well, we want a civil state. What is a civil state? You know, when you, uh, uh, you know, uh, Russia, well, what is a civil state? Well, a civil state is, uh, is a good state. Uh, uh, not necessarily, uh, there's confusion. There's confusion everywhere. Uh, and then some would say, oh, something like the Turkish uh, democracy. Uh, and others say, oh, no, no, not, not the London democracy or the Paris democracy, uh, but something like about a new democracy for the Arabs, right? So this is the answer you hear. Uh, like, and the thing that I never understood what I, what I meant, you know, is then, you know, oh, we want a civil state. What, what, do, you, what do you mean by a civil state? You know, the, so uh, I think it's still in development. And that is why we need national dialogue. Because national dialogue, it will enable or allow the parties to sit together and try to make sense of what do they really want in terms of, again, of the theory and, and the development. So far, no one knows. Right. And that's part of the major challenge that we're facing in these transition transitions because no one knows where, where it's going. 
Right. Now, in Egypt, um, now we try to explain to them the coup is not a democratic uh, practice, basically, no matter how you look at it. Uh, and then they say, well, they're terrorists. Right. See, then we have to, to stop them from. Uh, oh, and then you hear the prime minister of the coup government saying, we're going to uh, enforce democracy. How come you want to? You, you came in a coup, how come you come? Uh, so there is, there is a mess, basically, and there is confusion uh, over what do they really want, and whether it's a uh, Turkish democracy, or an American democracy, or an Arab democracy, or a civil state, or anything, or none of the above, uh, and no one claims to have the answer, and that is why, again, we go back to National Dalai and said, you need to set and talk and about what do you really want to achieve? Because with the Bolshevik Revolution, we know what we want. You know, we wanted uh, Marxist state. So it was clear. No, uh, uh, no, nothing needed. You know, for to, to that. But this is this is a major mechan mechanism preventing successful transition in the region because they don't they don't know what what they want and what they what do they want. The last thing about the drones. <laughs> the drones is a major dividing uh, thing. By the way. Yemen is in general, based on my interviews, they don't like Qaeda, but they don't like drones either. <laughs> so they don't want Qaeda and they don't want drones. So there is, uh, drones has a lot of politics. First of all, it was part of the um, American uh, Saleh uh, Alliance, the former president. And the former president manipulated the whole issue of relationship with the US. Uh, is that the Al Qaeda served his goal and tried to uh, to manipulate the cause and get more assistance and financial assistance and military assistance from the U.S. So it was, according to many analysts, and you have uh, general agreement on this, that Al that Saleh uh, was indirectly supporting Al Qaeda in order to keep it alive and continue to get the support from the U.S. that he wanted. Now. Drones, drones, the major issue, major problem with the drones is that uh, and it happens uh, a number of times where they miss their target. Like in 2009, one of the drone attacks missed its target in the, in the south, in the province of Lahaj, it's called, and then ended up killing 43 civilians, 17 of them women and children. Uh, immediately after, that was in 2009. Immediately, like a couple of months after that, we started to hear about a new uh, uh, group, like an, uh, uh, local contractors of Al-Qaeda, the Bajan, called Ansar al-Sharia. Ansar al-Sharia became more lethal than Al-Qaeda itself. Right? And the founders uh, of Ansar al-Sharia claimed that it's in response to the American attacks and the drones and, uh, and all that. So drones, uh, if you ask me, and they have never been successful. I mean, the, the policy for many years has been in Yemen, and Al-Qaeda got uh, even stronger in, in Yemen. The Yemenis, they hate Al-Qaeda, but they hate also the drones. And they're not at comfort or at ease with this alliance, the military alliance with the US that allows the, the drones, and continues again to be a dividing we have reached the end of our time. I hope you will uh, join me in thanking Ibrahim for a fascinating uh, conversation. We have some questions in the back.